Well, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Jennifer Shin, who is a dear friend, a co-resident, and a colleague. Uh, she is what we call Preparation H, meaning that she did her entire training at Harvard. That includes her undergrad degree, uh, medical school, residency, fellowship in uh, pediatric otolaryngology, as well as as a master's degree in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. She worked for a couple of years uh, at Kaiser Permanente here in California before returning to Boston and then moving through the ranks at Harvard. She is currently associate professor of otolaryngology head neck surgery. She's also associate uh, chair of vice chair of academic affairs for the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, as well as vice chair of faculty affairs for the Department of Surgery. And this is uh, really because of her amazing contributions uh, in the domain of both evidence-based uh, otolaryngology and uh, patient-related outcomes measures and her work on improving physician well-being. So just to give you an idea for her um, ability and drive, she wrote this uh, first and really most influential textbook on evidence-based otolaryngology head and neck surgery as a resident. And that book has already received, what, 60,000 uh, hits because it's so popular. She wrote another book after that, and then when, once she started in her own practice, she was really motivated to improve physician well-being when she noticed how much time we spend writing notes after hours. So she actually developed this program, which I hope we'll hear more about today. It's called AVID, and it's basically based on patients writing their own history based on them answering questions and uh, it goes through a decision tree. By now, she assembled this database of questions that has more than 10,000 questions. And ultimately, the history is written in the physician's voice. And that has been such a hit among so many departments uh, at Harvard that it really propelled her that she's now vice chair of faculty affairs because it's influenced people's well-being. So Jen, we are really delighted to have you and look forward to learning more about your exciting work. Thank you, Tina. If you ever want to feel good about yourself, you have <laughs> Tina Stankovich introduce you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Tina. And thanks to all of you uh, for the very kind invitation to be here. It's truly an honor uh, to be part of Graham Rounds at Stanford. This is such an amazing institution. I've had a fantastic time today uh, meeting with faculty and residents. Uh, and seeing what a, a stellar program this is. I really do think this group is some of the elite minds uh, within not just otolaryngology, but really within medicine at large. And so I want to talk to you today about some issues that we see that face actually much of our population uh, and also bring some challenges and also does get into AVID, as uh, Tina mentioned. So let me go into presentation mode here. Okay. So this is the issue that we face, 34 gigs and 174 newspapers worth of information. That's actually how much information we're faced with processing each and every day. So patients come, they tell us things, our colleagues come and add more information, and home life brings new knowledge too. And all of that together repeats every single day, and all of that can actually bring not only quite a lot of information and cognitive load, but also some challenges. So here are some common challenges that come in data. So one is, can we resolve common disagreements? Sometimes there are great data out there, strong data, uh, really meaningful data, but it really just doesn't align. And so we have to kind of figure out, how do we actually bring those things together? The second thing is that that's a lot of volume, 34 gigs. That can overwhelm even some computers. Uh, and so is it possible that we could somehow get that same level of information, but in fewer words? fewer numbers so that it would be less of a cognitive load for us. The third thing is thinking about accuracy. You know, we want to put ourselves into an environment where things are really accurate and that we're exposed to things that will really be based on substance. And how do we do that? The fourth is, you know, reading all that data and getting all that information actually takes a lot of time. And so 
because time is really one of our most precious commodities, if, if not our most precious commodity, I want to think about ways that we can try to get time back. And so fifth, there's actually a lot of very abstract, complex concepts out there, and we want to try to get those things into a means that is very tangible, something that's very solid, something that we can wrangle with and really make headway with. And then fifth, or sorry, sixth, especially for us in academic medicine, is it possible that we actually live certain paradoxes? And I think some of these things are really relevant to us. And it's just worth stopping to talk about uh, and think about this for a little bit. So first, let's talk about resolving <coughs> common disagreements. So um, we actually see a lot of things in our practices day to day that can give us a fair amount of cognitive dissonance. So one, for example, is the relationship between subjective patient reports and objective patient <coughs> outcomes. And I used to think this was actually really just an academic question, uh, but one of the leaders of one of our national professional organizations actually approached me at one of the annual meetings um, because it actually was coming up in things like conversations with third party payers. And I'm gonna show you just an example of this. So this is the uh, famously or perhaps infamously named SNOT 22 instrument, which those of you who are uh, well engaged with sinus disease know well. Now, the SNOT 22 instrument is absolutely fantastic. It has amazing properties, intra-rater reliability, internal consistency, discriminant validity, convergent validity, responsiveness to change, pretty much everything you want to see in an instrument. And so you would expect that folks who are here on this left side of the instrument where they have no problem, very mild problem, they feel great, their CTs would look great. On the other end of the spectrum, problems as bad as it can be, it's severe, mm -hmm. they expect they're not feeling well, their CT also would not look great. Instead though, sometimes what you see is this, there's actually a mismatch. And sometimes that subjective result and the objective result they don't always align. And when that happens, it can be a real source of dissonance for patients and physicians alike. Because when you see this, you might say to yourself, well, you know, if you're in clinic, well, am I really trying to just make this patient feel better? Um, or am I trying to get the CT better? If you're setting up a study, you know, like we were just talking about in the residence session, what's your primary outcome? You want to focus in on that objective result, try to get the CT as well, or you want to get into some of how the patient really feels. Now, I feel like when I went to medical school, it was definitely much more about objective outcomes. You know, that CT, it's gonna trump whatever the patient says about their subjective uh, experience. But increasingly, I think we're seeing this patient-centered approach. And you'll see that that's really a, a center cornerstone of things like PCORI, AHRQ initiatives. Um, it's at the heart of a lot of the things behind shared decision-making. And ultimately, I think when you're looking at patients and families, that's oftentimes what really is driving their calls to the office, that clinic visit. It's really about how they feel, not because they know they have some sort of objective test result. And so if you start to look into this further, you may actually find studies like this one. So this was a really well done study, multi-centered, prospective, validation study. And their goal was they really like the SNOT-22, so they wanted to bring that into their own language. There are obviously proponents of the instrument, which I, I think I am too. But what they found was that there was no significant correlation between the SNOT-22 and lun mckay scores. So lun mckay is how you can quantify um, CT scores. And they also noted that this was really similar to, to previous reports. No correlation between this great instrument and lun mckay CT scores. And what they actually concluded was that this actually underlines the fact that it's the patient with his or her perceived impairment that should be treated, not the radiological image. That wasn't, I think, the case when I went to med school. And so when you look at this, you think, okay, well, why is there this discordance? I mean, where does it come from? Well, maybe there's actually just a lot of heterogeneity in the population. Like maybe, you know, there's folks who have migraines and they're coming in with headaches. Maybe there's folks who have runny noses from CSF leaks. But when you look at a study like this, they actually very carefully controlled for their uh, inclusion criteria. They only brought in people who met EPOS criteria for diagnosis of chronic rhinus sinusitis. Furthermore, they only included folks who were on deck to get an informed consent for endoscopic sinus surgery. So, you know, these are really patients that you think are really definitely much more likely to have chronic rhinus sinusitis. <coughs> 
Now, one of the things that we actually talked about in the residence session uh, earlier today is that you can actually almost go too far into that end of the spectrum, though. So if you were to only enroll patients who only have positive CTs, high meaning bad Lund McKay scores, you actually are setting yourself up to have a problem if somebody comes in and they say, you know what, I'm feeling only mildly affected or I'm starting to feel better because that negative result in terms of your SNOT-22 doesn't have any possibility of matching up to a negative CT result solely because of the way you've brought the patients into the study. So in some ways, you actually want to have a little bit of heterogeneity in that study. And uh, one of the things I was telling um, them earlier today is that it's actually one of the reasons why when you're leveling studies, if you're looking at diagnostic tests, non-consecutive patients actually fall into level three because you want people who don't necessarily have that classic presentation so that you can get all ends of the spectrum and have your highest probability of matching both true positives and true negatives. So that study was really, really well done. Um, but it did make us wonder a little bit, you know, I wonder what would happen if we looked at a population, and it wasn't just everyone meets EPOS criteria, everyone's lined up for endoscopic sinus surgery. What if we actually had more people who could have a negative CT in that study? So we looked at it, and here's what we found. Exact same thing. These are the receiver operator characteristic uh, areas under the curve, and you can see that they're pretty much all around 0.5. So that means that you're essentially, it's as good as about flipping a coin, regardless of whether you're looking at the SNOT-22 overall score, the nasal domain, or any of the other three domains in there. So, you know, you really didn't actually make that much of a difference just by changing the <coughs> study population. And so we're left again with this cognitive dissonance, you know. Well, why do we <coughs> see this mismatch in these things that we know are so well established? And so we had one idea when we were looking at some of the um, baseline characteristics and the subgroups. And what we found was that in those who had worse psychological domain scores, <coughs> they had worse SNOT-22 scores, so higher is worse for SNOT-22, but they actually had better CT scores, so lower is better um, for Lund McKay scores. And then when we looked in the folks who were doing better in terms of their psychological status, psych like domain scores less than, point, uh, less than two, we actually found that their SNOT-22 scores were better, but their Lund McKay overall CT scores were worse. So that was actually really interesting. And so it prompted us to ask, is it actually possible that psychological status is an effect modifier of the diagnostic utility of SNOT-22 nasal scores? So what that means is modifier is present, then maybe that SNOT-22 and that CT don't align, but the modifier's absent, and maybe they actually can align. And so it's actually that third variable that is really making the difference. And so we took a look at that, did a stratified analysis, and you can see that when you look at psychological domain scores as a potential effect modifier, you can see that in the patients who are feeling better in terms of their psychological status, that ROC, AUC, is now creeping up towards about 0.7. So 0.7 is around the moderate range. So it's actually pretty good. Um, whereas 0.35 over here in the folks whose psychological status is worse, it's actually 0.35, which if anything is almost like a little inverse predicted. Um, and that was a statistically significant difference between groups. Now one of the nice things about SNOT-22 is it actually has some other built-in domains. And so there's some built-in controls and you could actually look at the ear scores and the sleep scores as well. And you can see if you break it down by the ear domain, there's no difference at all. It's 0.57 to 0.6 really doesn't make one bit of difference. The sleep domain is probably somewhere in between. It looks like they're sort of um, the point estimates, you know, a little higher, but it's not statistically significant. And this is just your um, the adjusted alpha because there was multiple comparisons. So um, what I think is interesting about this is that these are not patients that have, you know, these severe DSM-5 diagnoses. They don't have severe psychoses. They're not somehow dissociated from reality. These are patients who are just scoring on the lower side, meaning um, you know, uh, mild or worse uh, psychological status in terms of sadness, frustration, embarrassment, concentration, and productivity, which is what the SNOT-22 um, psychological uh, domain will capture. And so if you have 
both of these parts of information. You've got the nasal part of the SNOT-22 and the psychological part. The information is actually complementary. So it's kind of like you know, wine and cheese or some of these other delicacies that you might enjoy together. If you put them together, they can actually give you a little bit more benefit because once you understand one and have the other to complement it, you're actually more likely to know what your objective result is and you can actually align them and help resolve some of that cognitive dissonance. So it's not just in noses, uh, in ears. We actually also took a look and there's really some mismatch there as well. There have been these huge studies, 10,000 you know, or so patients, uh, where they looked at patients who reported subjectively how they were doing with hearing and they tried to align that with hearing test results. And really there was not very good alignment. Now, maybe some people are just in denial about their hearing loss, and I, we've probably all seen that. Um, but maybe, kind of like with the sinus disease, maybe there's actually something that goes beyond what you think of first as the obvious. And it actually is important because, you know, at Stanford and at Harvard, we're really lucky. We can get a hearing test anytime we want. But that's not the case everywhere in the world, and it's not the case even every place in this country. So if we can find a way to help align those things better, it's actually good for all of us. And so we were very lucky uh, that Dr. Bevan Yu actually let us use his inner ear instrument. So it is Bevan Yu. He's not just a head and neck cancer surgeon. Um, he actually developed this inner ear scale really to try to specifically look at how patients did after interventions for hearing. And we picked this instrument um, because we thought it was very practical it really actually gets into very specific things about what patients experience day to day. The conversations, different listening environments, having to repeat things, and so on and so forth. And so what we did was we started off and we just looked to say, okay, you know, I wonder if we would see something similar with psychological status. And in fact we did. You can see that if you look at the standard inner ear instrument, what I'll call the standard static scores, um, if their mental health was better, you could see that as their uh, scale scores improved, 25 points, 33 points, their probability of having a normal audiogram got better and better. And this was statistically significant across. And that's specifically designed for normal audiograms because that's actually what the mismatch is for hearing. Um, it's typically the sensitivity that's off. People think that, oh, you know, I'm fine, but they're actually not fine. So um, if you look, though, at the group that has worse psychological scores, um, same thing, no significant difference. It's a mismatch between the two groups. And so this mismatch, though, again, it's not you know, these big psychological issues. Um, we used a promise mental health scale, and the divider was really just to be in the, the bottom half of the U.S. population, which a lot of people are. By definition, half the U.S. population is there. And so, um, but you can really see this differential state in terms of the, the match. And so what we wanted to do is figure out, well, is there a way that we could take these things that are discordant, and that aren't really aligning, and make them into something that is concordant, but without changing the psychological status? Because in a lot of ways, we just really don't have any control over that, but we still want to see that alignment. So what we did was we actually developed an adaptive test. And I'll get into the details of that adaptive test, but essentially what I'll tell you uh, in, in advance of that is that we looked at 511 patients overall in the study. If we looked at an adaptive test score, it would actually almost perfectly mimic the standard static inner ear instrument, 11 items, just like we're used to seeing it, um, in terms of how well these increases could predict a normal audiogram result. But then furthermore, if we deployed the adaptive test in patients who had psychological restrictions or difficulties, we actually then got back that concordance. And so it actually just made that whole psychological status fade into the background. And it actually overcame the effect modification that was seen. So now we had alignment in both the groups and we're able to decrease that sense of cognitive dissonance. And furthermore, what was actually nice was that you could actually do less. Um, so inner ear is typically 11 items, um, but with the adaptive test, uh, patients got as few as three items, um, and sometimes up to eight items. 
And so for both us and them, we only had to climb this far. We didn't have to climb all the way up and do all 11 items, you know. So it was actually a little bit easier, but we still got to the point where we could see what we wanted to see. So what goes into an adaptive test? Like, where does it come from? Um, how do you know what to ask them so that you can overcome these things like effect modification by psychological status? Well, um, one of the things that you can do is you can start to apply some of the concepts that are used in very broadly uh, applied tests. So everyone here has done the SAT or you know, the MCAT, and likewise with those tests or the LSATs, um, the GREs, they're all oftentimes based on psychometric properties. And because these psychometric properties are very strong, they're proven across multiple populations, uh, they're really very strongly vetted, and they can be applied not only to educational tests like this, but also to certain healthcare outcomes. And some of you guys might have heard of PROMISE, um, or the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement uh, Information Systems, um, which was sponsored by NIH. And it's actually based on adaptive testing uh, that is utilized for specifically patients and their quality of life. And so what we wanted to do is say, OK, if we can understand those concepts, can we try to figure out how to apply that to things like trying to make concordance between sinus disease or ear disease? And so I'll tell you that if you have these 10 questions, three of them are going to be almost as good at asking as asking all 10 and two of them are going to be almost like you just like flipped a coin or something so just take a moment and think to yourself which of these three do you think are the three that are as good as you know all 10 and which of the two do you think really don't give you that much information so now I am sure that Tina and other people among you can figure this out right away. But me, I looked at this, I guessed absolutely wrong. And so I really needed some help from the data. And so I'm going to show you a little bit about you know, what this was. So the, the upshot was that these are the top three. It's discernment and different listening situations and understanding family and friends and filtering out unwanted noises that are almost as good as asking all 10. And these two? one of which I had guessed, and needing repetition, are pretty much not helpful at all. And so to explain how we know this, I'm just going to get into a very brief example in math. So in math, there's a whole continuum of abilities. So for example, there's 1 plus 2 is equal to 3 on this end. And on the other end is you know astrophysicist math proving the existence of alternate uh, universes and things like that. So people can lie anywhere along the spectrum. Now let's say you want to know where someone is on the spectrum. Well, you can ask them what's 1 plus 2, and maybe they say, hey, it's equal to 3. OK, well, they're still somewhere along this whole spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you could say, hey, can you show me how to calculate the uh, existence of alternate universes and show me the proofs? Well, you know, most people are actually going to get that wrong, certainly me. And so you're still somewhere in this big spectrum. But if you ask them something in between, something like a pre-calculus question, whether they get it right or wrong, you've actually narrowed down where they are on that spectrum. And so even this one question actually inherently carries more information than those other two questions. And then, let's say you ask them a pre-calculus question and they get it right. Well, then maybe you can ask them another question. Maybe they have to set up like an orbital regression model or something like that. And if they get that wrong, then you've now narrowed it down so that they're in this part of the spectrum. And so those two questions are inherently able to give you much more information about where that person is in terms of their math ability than these two questions. And so if you understand that, you can start to think about, well, you know what, maybe we can apply that to patient care also and the types of things we ask patients. Because if we can, it's good for everyone, less burden really for all of us. And so if you stop and think about, you know, how do we think about the spectrum for something like hearing loss, then you can do an analysis where uh, there's this thing, it's called theta, but essentially it's, it's what you call your underlying trait. So like math ability or hearing ability. The so population mean and then there's standard deviations on both sides. Each question gets a measurement of how much information it can convey.
and some can be high peaks, intermediate peaks, and low peaks. And as you start to understand that amount of information and how much it can discriminate among different patients at different types of levels, you can actually start to understand which questions are the highest yield. Now interestingly, the highest yield in terms of information and discrimination, it actually happens to align with the predictive value for audiometry as well. So if you look at these top ones, the ROC area under the curve is 0.7, so about moderate, but these guys are all the way down at 0.5, so might as well flip a coin. Now, if we can narrow it down even to three, you might ask, well, why not just ask one question? You know, just ask them how they're doing on their hearing test or their hearing overall. There's plenty of visual analog scales out there. And we did actually look at that. The inner ear scale, uh, part of the reason we also selected it is that it automatically comes with a global item. But if you look at that concordance, um, that ROC AUC, with uh, hearing test results for that single global item, it's unfortunately statistically significantly lower, about 0.6, you know, rather than 0.7. So you lose if you do just one question. But if you do the adaptive test, somewhere between 3 and 11 questions, um, you can really just very closely mimic how that original 10 to 11 item instrument does. You can also use this thing called an item response map, uh, and essentially it's got that same sort of x-axis as before. But what you'll see is that if you look at a specific thing, say like understanding crowded, uh, understanding folks in a crowded restaurant, and let's say people feel like, okay, we're doing fair. Um, if you look at that, people who are feeling fair in a crowded restaurant oftentimes are actually still feeling good in a quiet room. And they might still be feeling fair, you know, about soft household sounds. But oftentimes you might think, like especially if you look at a questionnaire, there's all these different answers that are always the same. You might think, well, good is good and fair is fair, and it's really the same across all of them. But it's actually pretty different. They change over between those states at different times. And so likewise, if you look at very good in a crowded restaurant, you're actually probably still excellent in a lot of other environments. And this whole thing corresponds to what's called like location or difficulty, and you can think about that kind of like you thought about, you know, the math problems getting harder and harder. There's different places where different questions land on that scale. And so if you can understand where those locations are and where each question is, then you can set up similarly an adaptive test to try to hone in on where patients are with a few or not questions. And so in this case, you know, less can definitely be equally effective um, as, as doing more than you know, what you had been used to. And so if you're thinking about that, you might actually wonder, well, could less then actually be more? Could less potentially outperform how we're doing um, with the larger number of questions? And so we actually looked at this in another uh, question set um, related to swallowing. So Peter Belafsky, you may um, know he has developed this instrument uh, called the Eating Assessment Tool, 10-item instrument. Great instrument, really well established, just like SNOT22 performs absolutely fantastically. He's been a great collaborator with us, and we've started to look at, you know, well, what would happen if we tried to hone in a little bit more? And the upshot is, if you can actually identify the right questions using similar techniques, you can actually outperform the 10 item instrument, especially if you're looking specifically for aspiration. Um, and even some of these other ones, uh, that aren't highlighted actually still do quite well relative to the standard 10 item instrument. And so you can also look at the odds ratios for how you progress from normal to penetration to aspiration and through that uh, progression through worse and worse disease. And again, you can see the shorter instruments, they can actually outperform the longer ones if you look at them the right way. And I think importantly, we're not just looking at the math here. The way we set up both of these adaptive tests is we applied the math plus clinical knowledge to set up exactly how the test would go. And so what we found is that less can actually be more. And that's, I think, a good thing, really, for all of us. And in doing so, you can resolve common disagreements and you can overcome any issues you know, related to <coughs> psychological um, status potentially being an effect modifier how well subjective and objective issues can align. And so it's actually nice, really, if less can be more. And uh, if you can get rid of some of that cognitive dissonance, it really just helps you focus your attention a little bit easier and get through your day a little bit easier. And I'll tell you, patients and families love it when we do this. Patients who have been in the practice a long time and are used to maybe getting the 10-item eat or 
you know, a, a longer um, survey, when they see that it's, it's shorter and it's smarter, they come back to you and say, I love that. I'm like, that was absolutely fantastic. It was much easier. And we love it too because there's less information that we have to go through as well. And so um, accuracy is really another thing that's really important to us um, as we proceed. And you know, one of the things that we do look at with regard to accuracy is how do we really preserve accuracy? There's so much information out there. Um, we actually dedicated an installment of our evidence-based medicine series specifically to look at falsehood and bias um, with this thought that we really do want to consider this issue of accuracy and data. And I, if you look at this information, it's actually both fascinating and disturbing. Um, there was a paper published in Science and these authors, they were from investigators from MIT, they looked at three million um, transitions of data uh, for uh, stories that had been put online. And these MIT investigators found that the top 1% of false stories actually reached all the way up to 100,000 individuals, whereas true stories really reached more than 1,000 individuals. And so what they concluded after looking at all of this data is that false information actually travels faster than true information. And very interestingly, if you look at this, similar effects have actually been observed through non-electronic mechanisms like word of mouth transition. And perhaps most disturbingly, repetitions of falsehood can actually subvert your prior knowledge of the truth. And they actually think that that's how the Nazis during World War II were able to make so much strides because they just kept repeating these certain ideas uh, into the population over and over again. And as one epidemiologist said who studied this, the spread of rumors is actually analogous to the spread of an epidemiologic infectious disease. And they actually use similar modeling to an analyze that. So it's actually very interesting thinking about that. And I think you all might even have some intuitive sense of that uh, because maybe you've seen patients come into the office and they talk about you know, the things that they've seen online or heard on YouTube and you know, you're thinking to yourself, you know, gosh, like, but there's all this data or you know, there's uh, all this information that would lead us in a different direction. But somehow mentally, people can actually be more swayed by some of these other things that they see. So I think that's actually worthwhile to really stop and think about because this is apparently how our natural brains are wired. So I think if you don't actually stop and think about this, you, it's very easy to just go down these various pathways um, because that's, that's it's what the data looks like. And so um, a lot of you may have also seen um, these data from um, COVID. So these are uh, psychological status data. And uh, what was observed very, very clearly uh, through all our mental health experts was that mental health clearly got a lot worse during the pandemic. Depression, anxiety, um, I think uh, we are overworked, but I think honestly a lot of our uh, psychology colleagues are in many ways um, even more overworked. And even as the pandemic has regressed, and for a lot of us we start to feel like, okay, we're getting used to these various things, um, mental health issues are continuing to rise. And so um, I think it is important to think about psychological status and how it affects our patients you know, day to day uh, and the types of things that they're reporting to us. Likewise, we should think about us too. So, you know, all of us have seen the physician burnout numbers. 42% um, was uh, from a study, 19,000 physicians across all different subspecialties um, who really reported that they themselves were also feeling burned out. And the most common reasons were too much charting and paperwork, spending too many hours at work, um, lack of respect, or increasing computerization of their practice with spending too much time typing and dictating and all those things into their EHRs. Now Stanford has an amazing program for physician burnout. Um, it's probably, I would think, the premier program in the country. Um, you guys have Tate Shanafelt, 600 plus publications about burnout. It's absolutely amazing. So you know, kudos to this institution for all that it's done uh, along those lines. Um, this is a related concept um, that I think is also worth mentioning, um, especially if we, as we think about you know the physician potential predicament um, relative to. Um, this concept of moral injury. And so uh, physicians, um, as written by Simon Talbot, who's actually the head of uh, the Physician Council at one of the local hospitals, 
um, may be suffering from this thing called moral injury. And so moral injury is classically used to des describe a battlefield state where um, soldiers are uh, sort of put in these potentially self-contradictory positions. So for example, they need to value life, but also go out there and be sure that they take it. So likewise, I think clinicians want to give patients more of what they want, more information, more involvement in their decisions, more sympathy, things that take time. Um, but at the same time, there's also an impetus to try to get patients through as quickly as possible uh, to really try to improve that bottom line. And so sometimes physicians can actually feel like they're sort of caught in the middle of this, and they can feel some sense of moral injury. And sometimes they can actually be pretty tiring, just like cognitive dissonance can be tiring um, to the population. Clinicians sometimes feel like they're squeezed or, or tired out from this process. So, you know, what do we do about all this? Um, we have all these conundrums, you know, relative to our current state. Well, so there's a few options. So one option is you could regress. You know, pediatric otolaryngology, you could wail and bemoan and cry. But I have a feeling that's definitely not the persona, you know, of the group here. Um, some people actually decide to leave medicine over this. And there's actually a group where they have 12 people in their division, um, five of whom uh, left the division, two of whom actually even filed uh, gender complaints against their division chief. And that division, having been in the black for 30 plus many decades, um, has gone into the red. And so sometimes actually, if you look at it honestly, people really struggle in this circumstance. Other groups say, you know what, we're tough as nails, these are the Navy SEALs, and we will absolutely keep going. If you ever hear some of these Navy SEALs uh, give lectures or um, to describe some of their experiences in their books, uh, the Navy SEALs uh, will run for 24 hours straight. They will swim long distances with pneumonia. They essentially just say, you know what, we are keep going, you guys can't hurt me, here we go. And I, I think probably that's what most of us really are inclined to do. Um, but if you really stop and think about it, I think this very, very smart man is actually right. It, you got to think about something different. You know, you can't solve your problems with the same thinking that you use to create them. And so we actually looked at this and we said, you know what, let's try to understand what goes into a physician day. And, and that's really mostly our patient-physician time together. And there's three things that really go into patients and physicians time together. So first, there's that counseling. That's a thing that I alluded to earlier where you know, patients want more of it, that more time and counseling, that more understanding, that more sympathy. That's what they're really there for when they get together. Uh, someone, could you mute yourself, please? So um, there's also physical exam. So physical exam, obviously you got to be together, you know, for that. Yeah, uh, no, it's Faridey, can you please mute yourself? Because I can't do it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Maybe the guys are also packaging. Well, this is Farsi. Um, so how do I... The third thing is history taking. And so history taking oh, has long been considered a very vital part of our patients. And so... I think we might have lost the mic with... Okay. Yeah. Oh, is the mic off too? I can just go like to low volume. Uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so patient histories. So um, I, I think, in fact, he actually is getting a patient history, ironically enough. I think he's asking about nausea and things like that. But um, so patient histories. Um, when Lauren Hollinger gave his keynote address, uh, the Cotton Fitton Lecture at the American Academy of Otolaryngology, he actually really focused on patient histories. And he talked about how patient histories will really never go out of style, that they're very much of critical importance, and that you actually have to help patients identify exactly what they're talking about, thinking about the severity, um, the duration, all those different factors that help you make decisions about whether you're going to operate on those patients. And so when we take our patient histories, whether you're using a very carefully designed system or you're asking them in that day-to-day -day in clinic, you're actually applying all that you have learned in your 13 to 17 years of training to uncover exactly what you need to know. 
it's not enough if they just come in and say, hey, there's a bunch of sore throats and, you know, maybe some fevers. You don't know if you're going to operate on that child based on that. You need to know if they meet the paradise criteria where there's seven infections on the prairie. There's very specific things that you need to know based on your level of understanding. And so if you look at patient histories and you take four minutes to obtain a history and three minutes to document it, maybe you see like 30-some patients a day or any one of these other variants, five minutes and five, and, or 2.5 and 2.5. Uh, for us as surgeons, let's say you're in clinic maybe two days a week, this actually amounts to a huge amount of time. If you add that up, it's actually 9.3 work weeks for each clinician every year. That's actually a huge amount of time. I mean, think about like what you would be like if you could get two months back every single year. And so when we looked at this, because it is so important, we also invest actually quite a lot of dollars into it. Um, this is a standard average U.S. practice based on some of the academy survey information over time. You know, roughly about four to five providers in that average practice. And you can see that there's quite a bit that's invested into MAs, LPNs, nurse practitioners, uh, physicians assistants, and RNs, all of whom can oftentimes help with that history taking uh, component. And quite a bit of dollars can go into that as well. And while our staff and us are all taking those histories and putting them into the computer for the medical record, a lot of other things get undone. Uh, and so all those things can sometimes be left to the 11th hour. And this is an issue that is going to face us basically as long as the creeks and rivers flow and the sun and moon and stars endure. As long as we go on, we're always going to need to ask patients why they're here, what the severity is, and understand those very specific, highly intellectual key components of their histories that let us make decisions. And so we looked at this and we said, okay, well, you know, there's history taking, there's exam, there's counseling. All these three things, they're really important. And they're so important that it really seems like they're immutable. But if they are immutable and there's nothing that we can change, then we're really just still left with this, you know, this burnout, this moral injury. We're not really thinking about things in a way where we could change them. And so we tried really hard to think about this and how we could actually change it. Because, you know, sometimes you go see the sequel to a movie and that rock hard, <coughs> rigid robot actually is surprisingly mutable after all. And so what we tried to do was actually move the history taking out of that face-to-face -face component of the visit and thereby hopefully give a better day <coughs> to both us and them. We started this first uh, out in the waiting room pre-COVID. Uh, we did the initial run on paper. Very, very complicated to do because obviously there's a lot of different things that can come in. It's very hard for the staff to sort between that. So then after that, we transitioned to an electronic tablet-based system. And within this system, as Tina mentioned, we have thousands of questions that have grown in a bank over time. The system's intelligent, so it knows, it thinks about what age you're in, uh, what your background is, what um, your complaint is, and it offers different questions accordingly. So if you come in for recurrent ear infections, you get asked about ear pain, fevers, hearing loss, um, antibiotics that you might have taken. And if it's a kiddo and they're coming in for that and we need to understand what speech and language is, a four-month-old is going to ask, get asked very different questions for the parents if they have kids that are two years old or four years old because speech and language milestones are very different for all of those age groups. Mm -hmm. And if it's a nasal issue, then they're going to get something that's along those lines. And then, very importantly, for sanity and for the health of our <laughs> clinicians, it then takes that information and then it automatically translates it into an appropriate documentation ready note. So it's already translated it into medical language. If there's quantitation that needs to be done for patient reported outcome measures or whatnot, automatically calculates those things in the background. And it's pretty friendly for putting in things like adaptive testing, like I was mentioning earlier. And so if you can do this, um, it's actually great for the staff. Interestingly, we've gotten the uh, some of the most positive feedback from the PAs that are typically out there being the scout or the resident that's typically out there being the scout. And for the clinicians that don't have um, that person who's with them there in clinic, we have gotten immensely positive feedback. Um, because essentially what we're doing is you're starting off, typically you bring the patient into the room, you write down what they tell you, or you memorize it, or you dictate it, or you type it into the computer. 
and then after this whole convoluted process, your notes in the chart. Instead, what we wanted is patient tells you what's going on, notes in the chart, and then you can append it with you know other things that are also important, but it's also those key things that you know are already in there. And as I mentioned, we've gotten great positive feedback uh, from the clinicians who have tried this. In our initial pilot run, 11 minutes was the median time savings when combining um, obtaining and documenting the patient history. We actually just looked at this uh, internally uh, a few weeks ago um, as we started to spread into some of the surgical specialties and, and also into medicine. And I, I was actually quite amazed at the data that came back, so much so that I actually sent it back and I said, go look at it again, I don't believe it. Um, but it was actually 11 minutes in obtaining and 11 minutes in documenting. And I said, that cannot be. But then I realized it's because we actually started to onboard medicine groups as well. And so for all of us, I don't think we would ever spend 22 minutes in obtaining and documenting a patient history, but I think in the medicine groups, that they actually will do that, um, and that's you know, more where they are. So, so we find that we actually can gain time back, you know, if you think about some of these um, uh, uh, areas and, and where we can actually intervene. So another nice thing about this system is that um, it's consistent. Um, it uh, doesn't have to take a sick day. Um, it doesn't have any unconscious biases. It's not going to get distracted by a phone call. It doesn't have to go to lunch. It can just consistently do, you know, what it's supposed to do in an adaptive way each time. And so it's kind of nice. It serves as a fail-safe for getting the right information. And I think there's real value to that. There's actually studies in the literature where they've looked at sort of standard patient-physician discourse versus using some type of structured questionnaire. And what they found is that you can actually miss about 20% of things that patients tell you that may actually be important if you, if you are, are uh, not relying on something additional. In this case, they used a patient-reported outcome measure. It was kids who had leukemia and lymphoma. Um, but you'll see that uh, similar data elsewhere as well. So these validated instruments really have a lot of very interesting properties. Um, and they can help us capture things that are quite abstract. And so um, for those of you who treat kids and think about obstructive sleep apnea, you might have seen this study, which is the CHAT study. Um, looked at kids um, and the effect of either observation or early adenotonsillectomy on obstructive sleep apnea. Great study, 464 kids, five to nine years of age. And what they found that was so interesting was that 65% improved with observation alone if their median AHI was um, less, or if their AHI was less than the median, which was 4.7. And that really opened the door to us potentially observing kids who have mild obstructive sleep apnea. And they also did a follow-up study where they looked at quality of life. And what they found, though, was that the early adenotonsillectomy kids had about a 20-point improvement in obstructive sleep apnea validated instrument scores. And in that case, actually did better and watchful waiting. And they found that that baseline OSA severity, regardless of really how they measured it, didn't influence that association between the treatment arm and the quality of life. And what they concluded, again, just like that prior SNOT-22 study, was that you know, we, we actually have to think about how these patients are doing in terms of their subjective reports. Uh, because if we're just looking at the sleep studies and these objective things, we're actually neglecting some potential benefits. And so if you look at related data, another fantastic study, prospective, 64 kids, honed in on this question then of, well, what should we do with mild obstructive sleep apnea? Because here's an example of cognitive dissonance. Their AHIs, well, you know, maybe we should actually observe them for seven months because they can really get better. But based on their quality of life indices, you would actually take them all for early adenotonsillectomy. So what they did was they studied these kids and they let parents actually um, take the pathway that they wanted to. And what they found was that the parents who chose the pathway of surgery, they started off with worse quality of life scores and that they had a statistically significant improvement. But then they looked at the kids who had observation and you know what, they didn't change very much, but they actually also started off a lot better. And so I actually use this in my practice. I'm like very data driven. And so I give patients the OSA 18 instrument and I look at the scores. And I actually talk to parents and I say, you know what? You're in like the 65 to 80 plus range. You actually could really drop if you underwent surgery. And the way you actually talk to them about this is not, you know, in terms of like numbers and things like that, but you actually talk to them about the questionnaire that they just did. 
So if you understand the OSA 18 and how it works and that their sleep scores are essentially going to go from, you know, roughly 3.8 to 1.6, what that really means is that if they're out there and on average they're experiencing these usual things of, you know, breath holding, choking, restless sleep, some of the time it's going to drop to somewhere between none of the time and hardly any of the time. And if you talk to parents about that, they understand that much easier than they understand in talking about like, hey, I'm going to try and get your AHI less than two, or I'm going to try and get your um, nadir oxygen, you know, into the 90s range. And if you look at patients, there's actually a great study that came out of this very institution uh, by some people who are nearby, uh, and they looked at health literacy, and apparently 10% um, may not have as much health literacy as we hope they do. And so if there's some way that we can connect with patients and talk to them in a way that they can really understand, I think it's actually really beneficial. And so we'll use this to support shared decision making. And shared decision making, I think, is really a cornerstone of a lot of the practice elements that we have, um, certainly in pediatrics and also in a lot of the elective treatments that we give. Um, and it's got a real practical benefit, actually. It can decrease decision conflict. And if you look in this study, they looked at um, you know, five, six different elements. Um, using shared decision making and having that collaborative approach was the one thing that could actually decrease decision conflict. And what that translates into is there's less delayed scheduling, less canceled surgery, less non-adherence to treatments, and less of those you know, periods where patients are sort of vacillating about what to do. So they also have some other interesting properties if you look at validated instruments. And so um, we looked at uh, VHI-10 scores and how they performed relative to standard uh, uh, queries that we give patients, you know, are you, is your voice weak, is your voice breathy, um, can you shout? Uh, and if you look specifically at vocal fold paralysis, in the study of 204 patients, VHI-10 actually has a stronger predictive capability than the things that we ask them in our day-to-day -day speech. Now that's not always the case. Uh, there are actually some other instances where um, the validated instrument doesn't do as well, but it's actually pretty interesting to look at these data and understand, you know, which questions are actually the highest yield. And so, um, you know, I talked about capturing the abstract and really trying to make something concrete. And so I think that you'll see that uh, when we look at data that comes into us from studies, that's really what they're trying to do um, with the validated instrument component of it. So, for example, like that chat study, even though it's called the chat study, you, you couldn't come back and just have, you know, parents chit-chat answers. Like, they, you couldn't just say, oh, you know, the parents said this, and they thought it was great, and all these other things. Like, no, they, to publish that study, they're expecting that you have a validated instrument result really to track how the patients are doing. And without that, it would probably be hard to get it published because people would say, well, you know what, maybe it's actually not accurate um, because, you know, we need these validated measures to, to ensure that accuracy. Um, but when you stop and think about that, there's actually sort of a paradox in there because in our studies, we won't let something into the literature unless it's really demonstrated by one of these validated instruments. But in our day-to-day decision-making, I don't know about you, but I've classically always just asked patients in my own families, like, hey, how you doing? Like, they say they're feeling better. I'm like, great, more of the same, or we're done. They say they're feeling worse. I'll say, okay, you know, what else can we do? Maybe there's something else that we can apply. Um, but if you think about it, you, we actually don't know if that day-to-day -day colloquial speech actually would match up with the things that we get out of these highly validated studies. And so when we were looking at this, we said, you know what, I wonder if there's actually concordance between what patients tell us day-to-day um, -day and validated instruments. And so we looked at the inner ear, um, we looked at eustachian tube dysfunction, we looked at nasal obstruction, and we looked at sinusitis. And the upshot, really, of all of this was that there was only about 50% concordance for correct categorization if you looked at patients like day one and then uh, day 50, and they actually got better on their validated instrument, whether they themselves actually felt like they got better. And so um, when we looked at this, we said, you know what, it, it's actually sort of an interesting paradox because we're doing all these things and we're making all these decisions in our day to day, but we're doing it on something that might only have 50% concordance with something that we would uh, demand, really, in our literature.
And so it's kind of like looking at this image. There's a young woman there and there's an old woman there. And they exist simultaneously, but we just live this paradox. And, you know, it's, it's kind of this thing that, you know, once you think about it, it's hard to ignore. Kind of like once you see the sign and it says ignore this sign, you just keep looking, you know, at that sign. And so, you know, we live a paradox day to day. And I, I think that's part of being in academic medicine in many ways. Um, there's things like this and, and there's other things as well. Um, I think one that we're all very, very accustomed to is, you know, we've got this clinical mission, we've got this academic mission, we've got this teaching mission. You know, you want to be a rock star in all three. You want to be you know, climbing everything um, for all three. But really, there's like a fixed amount of time, you know, in, in every day. And so I, I love being in academic medicine. I, I actually am in favor of this. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I, I do a fair amount of advising for the, the academic affairs things. And when you talk to the junior faculty and folks who are coming in, especially folks who are coming in out of residency where the work hours um, were more controlled, this is really more like what they describe. They feel like this sense of being like almost like shell-shocked by trying to do all these three things at once. And it, it actually is hard, you know, to, to balance all these different things. Because what they'll say is that, you know, my clinical productivity is great, I'm generating all these RVUs, but then I don't have time to do research. And then on the opposite end of things, maybe they're really academically productive, they're doing tons of research, but they don't have time to go into the OR, and so they, they can't make enough money. And so trying to balance these two things actually can really be a challenge for folks. And so one of the nice things about setting up a data collection system like this is that it aligns these missions. Folks who are your busiest clinicians are actually the fastest to develop their databases because they're seeing so many patients. And you can actually even pair folks together with folks who are really clinically busy, don't have time to write papers, but maybe they're really interested in academics, maybe they want to be promoted. Um, and having a system like this actually lets you align those things really well. And so uh, some of our busiest clinicians um, have taken their data, and um, this is Tom Carroll. He uh, won first prize at the American Laryngological Association a couple years back um, using data with our then med student, uh, now resident, um, Ellie Kirsch. And this particular character, I think a lot of you may know, uh, Dr. Eduardo Corrales, um, who did his residency here, still a huge, huge fan of Stanford, um, also took his data and actually won first prize at an international conference. So, you know, we talked about capturing the abstract in terms of abstract concepts. We can also capture the abstract in terms of, you know, being able to submit one. And when we think about living this paradox, you know, we think about this various mission um, and all these different components of it and that, you know, they might be potentially at odds with each other. But, you know, we try to think about ways that they can actually be aligned. And then so, you know, we hope that maybe down the road, things like burnout and that sense of moral injury and things like that can actually improve. So we've talked about data in our day-to-day -day and how we can resolve common disagreements, how less can be more, how accuracy can be preserved, you know, if we think about it and with some effort, how we could potentially gain some time back, how we can capture the abstract and how we can live a paradox, and revisiting those two things twice. So thanks very much. Um, very much appreciate your attention. Thank you for a fabulous presentation, and uh, Sam has a question. Hi, thank you. Just a fantastic overview of problems and, uh, and just the work you're doing is very fascinating. I, I have some interest in this too. Um, and I, I was really fascinated by the adaptive, the talk about the, you know, the part about the adaptive questions and, and you know, the problem that I'm using in Rioplast that we developed. We're looking at specific questions also, how they may be helpful. Um, and the whole psychological aspect is a huge part of what, what I'm studying, actually. So I'm really interested in understanding how it seemed you implied that using the, the adaptive questions also allowed you to bypass the, the modifiers. And I, I'm not sure I understand that because in my mind, a lot of that will still be present. And could So could you explain that part a little bit? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll agree with you. When I first saw the data, I was like, how did that work? Um, but I think it actually comes out of something that's in like Bayesian theory. So um, essentially, if your pretest probability is higher, then the probability um, that you'll your post-test odds are also higher um, uh, travels together. So essentially, what I think is actually happening is that the adaptive test 
is improving the pretest odds of those who will end up in the group whereby we think that they will have either that worse audiogram or the better audiogram. So for example, um, like I mentioned that we use like a, a clinical aspect of it too, like you know, if it's educational tests, it's really just about the numbers, but um, what we did in that particular instance was we combined the numbers with a study that Bevan had done um, where he demonstrated that with the inner ear, the, um, uh, the baseline group had a certain level of scores, but that after intervention, they would rise from like the mid-20s, like it was basically like 29, all the way up, you know, into like the you know, 50s, 60s range at least. And so we incorporated that knowledge of where that threshold would be such that if you scored less than 30 on that adaptive test when you came in with those initial three questions, it would actually let you exit the test. And so we know that based on those three questions, they're already performing poorly. That group performed, or they, they answered less, but their pretest probability of having a worse audiogram result is actually higher because we let them exit the test already showing that their scores are going to be low. If you don't squarely land in that category, or it's like kind of like all over the map or whatnot, then it actually takes you through a whole other series of questions. So I think it's actually by changing your pretest probability. I have more questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So um, the, the, I was fortunate to be with Bevan and Ed Weaver and a lot of people in Seattle um, early in my career, so well familiar with those guys. And Ed, Ed Weaver, I'm sure you're familiar with. He did a really interesting study back in 2005-06 with um, at, at UW where he looked at the nose questionnaire. And, and one thing that we see in rhinoplasty a lot is that what you hit on is that with sinusitis is that the physical findings that we see often do not correlate at all with, with what they say subjectively and so on. And, and so he looked at um, quantitative measures of the nasal airway. I don't remember which ones he used now. It's almost 20 years ago. I uh, looked at the nose questionnaire and showed there's really no correlation. So it's a very, and this, this thing's across the board. And for us who do a lot of rhinoplasty for breathing and stuff, and even people who do septoplasty, they'll, they'll see this. Um, and uh, routinely patients will ask me, what percentage improvement can I get in my airway and so on? And, and I do exactly what you talked about, which is I say, studies in our, in our group um, have shown that if we do such and such a procedure, your scores will go down by 2.5 points. So you go from a five to a two and a half, you're not going to go to zero. You know, you're still going to have problems. And I think they really, that's really helpful. Um, I don't know if they do that JP too, but, but it's really, it's a nice way to talk to patients and we have sort of severity scores and everything that we use around the nose and, and the schnoz, which is a, is a rhinoplasty questionnaire. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, they're both fantastic. And uh, I'm pleased to, I'm excited to hear that you're doing that also because, you know, it's nice that it, it works in other um, subspecialties as mm -hmm. well. I think you're right. It's it's not even just an otolaryngology. I think we see this, and I, I wonder if it's because a lot of these things were aptly set up for research. You know, they weren't really set up as much for clinical care, but we're using them in clinical care. So we just have to, I think, just like you're doing, you know, think about how we apply them. Thank you for that, those questions. Great questions. I had a quick question. So what was hard for me to generalize was kind of for each of these different problems what is the best kind of ground truth, right? Like what are you, what is your goal? One is like lung McKay and, you know, aligning that with their subjective symptoms. But I think in each different scenario, you might have like a slightly different goal. And I think to, to advocate for the people who like to like kind of meander around and encounter with a patient in a very inefficient way, I, I was kind of wondering why I might like to prefer to do that sometimes. And I think it's because like the, the thing I'm looking for I don't believe is in the instrument. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so you're like, well, that's great. I understand that this is validated. But the thing I'm looking for is just a little different. And then the instrument sometimes, like Sam designed a very nice one that has a couple things that I always look at. But there's other instruments in my life that I have a really tough time. So it's kind of like, what are you really after in each encounter, right? I understand efficiency is great, but it, that to me seemed murky and hard to, you know, immediately put into all facets of my practice. I'm sorry if that's a little vague, but I mean, that's that's the part that seems to be the trick, right? Like, do you have a great instrument already? 
what is the goal of the execution of this? Yeah. Is it just to align disparate facts or is it efficiency? It just seems like there was, you know, a, a little bit of flexibility there. Is it? That's a great question. So, you know, I'll say that I think what you're saying is correct, and it, it sort of is dovetailing off of, you know, the comment that I made that um, a lot of these, the instruments at least, are developed for research not necessarily for your clinical day-to-day. -day. And so that's why we'll oftentimes actually deploy them in concert with each other. They are, I think, complementary. I think someday in the future, it, ultimately they will actually align um, because, you know, we'll, people are using them uh, in day-to-day -day practice. And it may actually be, you know, I showed some things where the instruments actually did better than the day-to-day. The -day. But uh, if you look at the data, there are actually some instances where the day-to-day -day or a global scale actually does better than uh, a validated instrument. I think that's so, so valuable because then the field can look at it and say, you know what, we actually should tweak this. Do you know what I mean? Instead of just kind of letting it go on for years and years and years. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, ultimately, it's actually, it's very interesting. I, I actually had the same, same thoughts as you relative to, you know, some of these instruments, maybe they give us what we need, maybe they don't. Um, and so we actually very specifically tried to deploy in private practice because they obviously don't care about research. They just want to, you know, talk to patients and get them in, get the facts and get out. Uh, and so uh, we gave it to them and then they would come back to us with things like, okay, you know, this whole set of like 10, I only want like four of them. And, you know, I would say, okay, that's a validated instrument, you know, typically you, like you keep the whole thing or not, but and they're like, no, 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 John, like I, I only want the four of them. So I'd say, okay, fine, like, that's totally great. Like, let's do it because I'm actually curious to see, you know, what is the more um, clinically useful component of it. And so we actually, we have deployments where that's like half an instrument. Like, we can't use that for research, but that's what that practice specifically needs. And so um, I actually think every practice is different. Even within like a, a type of clinical area, every practice is different, every practitioner is different. And they approach patients in a different way. But you can actually really learn from that. And we have, um, you know, questions that will fire for like three practitioners because they want like those three questions and somehow, you know, very clinically useful for them. So, I, you know, I, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's partly about the validated instruments, but it's not all about the validated instruments. Like you can't use TAHSI to figure out if you're going to do tonsil surgery. You have to ask them like the paradise criteria and, you know, like those things. So question. Hi Jen, great talk. Uh, I, I'm also fascinated by the adaptive um, you know, question and so I'm just wondering, is, it sounds like you've already deployed uh, this type of testing in clinical practice. I mean, how did you, did you do that? And, you know, and I guess, you know, it's kind of surprising that here most of our questionnaires are still on paper. So I'm assuming this was this something that would require <laughs> electronic, to do electronic filled out, right? Is this some sort of like algorithm in the background that determines which question to present to the patient. Yeah, that's a great question, Uchike. Thank you for that. So um, it is indeed electronic. Uh, it, it would, I think, be tough to do on paper, just as you say. Um, it actually it calculates in the background. So it's calculating the concordance um, and measure of standard deviation for the initial questions, and then where it is relative to a certain clinical threshold. And then it just it follows that same calculation in the background. So the patients don't see it. They just see that, okay, it stopped or more questions came up. Um, but that's what it's doing in the background. And then it calculates the total score based off the total potential um, uh, score. So, you know, obviously if it's 10 questions, scale of 100, you know, each one's worth 10. Um, it's different because you don't know how many are going to actually be answered. So you scale it, or at least we scaled it to 100 so that we could compare it against the actual instrument. So um, talking about the logistics to that point of your question, um, pre-COVID, we would actually give out a tablet uh, in the waiting room, and then they, you know, they could just click through. Uh, when COVID came, there was no waiting room. <laughs> so we, it, we were not at all equipped to do anything except for hand out a tablet in the waiting room. So we, we almost had to start over because we, we had to figure out how to do remote deployments um, to patients who were not ever coming on site. And so we, we did it though. Uh, I, I have to say, I originally said, you know what, let's just wait guys because, you know, it's so hard to set up a whole new system. And then three days into it, the clinic, the virtual visits, the docs who were already on the system are calling me like, Jen, it's even worse because I have no MA to get, you know, this part of the history. We have to get back online. 
So I said, okay, let's do it. So then, you know, we jumped in. We tried to figure out how we could you know, do it in a remote way. We had to transition our platform. We had to change our security protocols. Um, but we, we did it. Um, got back up, you know, and running. And, and now the practices, um, it's very different. Some practices stayed on tablets the whole way through. All through COVID, they never left it. They wiped tablets. They wiped styluses. Um, other practices went um, to all remote sends. Um, and some of the practices do a combination. They do a remote send, and then afterwards, if it's like somebody missed it or they didn't do it or some patients don't have a smartphone, you know, or, or good internet or things like that, um, then they can get the tablet in clinic. Um, so, so, but you, maybe you could try to do it on paper, like um, maybe like the, the way taxes used to be, you know, like if you did this, go to that, you know. But I, it's, I think it would be... <laughs> so is this linked to your EMR? Does it like automatically like, populate once a patient does it? It's calculated. It's a great question. So when we first started to develop this, um, we went to our EMR, which is Epic, uh, and um, I, I, you know, I described to them what I wanted to do, uh, and I, we already had questions developed and things like that from that whole paper trial that you know I had gone through. And uh, they said, okay, you know, we'll have some engineers look at it, and they came back and they said, absolutely not. We, this is way too complicated. You absolutely cannot build this into Epic. Epic is like for 50 static questions, like tops, maybe 70. But like you absolutely can't like have all this stuff in there. It's okay. So then we tried to actually build it in RedCap, um, and uh, we got uh, applied for funds and got funds, and um, we applied five figures into a RedCap engineer uh, team to let them try to build it. We crashed RedCap like three or four times, and then I said, okay, we have to stop because like every time it doesn't work, like I just feel like, you know, we're, we're just starting over all, all over again. So ultimately, um, we actually transitioned and we, we, um, we started with a, a questionnaire system, but we had a custom build um, for it, and that's, that's what we're, we still utilize. So how do the clinicians get that information? I'm guessing they then enter it into the, the the patient's chart? It's a great question. So um, we do have uh, a means to put it into Epic. Um, I personally, and this is my own bias, um, I personally am uneasy with something automatically going into somebody's record with nobody reading it. And so like